Schmitz, and I'm the chief for the division of Office of Indian Economic Development, and um, wanted to welcome everyone back for the second day of our tourism grantee meeting. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to hear about the Astro Tourism, the Night Skies presentation, which was really intriguing and hope that everyone found that useful information. We also heard from Ana Lebeau and Dave Castillo talking about um, resources for business development and strategic planning. And then we also had an opportunity to hear from our own team, our economic development specialists who were um, providing information about resources. And so today is going to be an opportunity for all of us to um, come together and um, share information. The, the bulk of what we're gonna be doing are presentations from some of the tourism projects that the Office of Indian Economic Development has been um, pleased to support. So we're really excited to hear from them and we hope that it's really um, an opportunity for all of you to, to hear about other success stories and other innovative ways of um, pursuing economic development in your communities. So um, I also want to encourage everyone to start thinking about the grantee networking that we're going to do today. It's an opportunity for you all to connect with one another, to hear about each other's projects, to share where you're at. And if you're having struggles, you know, what, what things have others done to, to move forward. So think, just keep that in mind as we're moving forward through our presentations today. Um, I'd like to just take an opportunity now. I will turn it over to Dennis Wilson, and he will introduce our first speakers for the day. Thank you, Denise. Appreciate that. And I second everything Denise said. Um, we're happy everybody's here. Uh, we encourage you to network and think ahead, strategize ahead, collaborate as much as we can uh, together or amongst yourselves. Uh, so I'll be moderating today as well uh, through these presentations. So first up, uh, we're going to have Oksape. We have Patty Martinson, the director, and Terry Badhand. Um, as you can see in their bio and some of the PDFs you received, um, they're going to share what they've learned over 30 years working with Native communities. So without further ado, Patty and Terry, take it away. Greetings. We're, we're very pleased and happy to be here and to share our, our project that we've done for the last two years um, called building connections and strengthening communities for the future with food sovereignty. So we're going to begin by showing you um, the, the community food system work that we spent 30 years on here in Taos and shared with tribal communities and community tribal community organizations from around the country beginning with a grant from um, from a foundation, a national and international foundation called Oxfam, which allowed us to bring people that were working on their community food systems and got in touch with us uh, to bring them to Taos to experience the, the food center and really get to know each other and take take some classes and some educational opportunities at that time. And then we'll talk about um, Woksape and the past two years of all of our adventures um, during COVID. And, you know, I, I can't really talk about everything that that has been going on without mentioning that while we started working on building native community food systems, finding ways to get the infrastructure, um, really looking at bringing back those indigenous foods and medicines, and that those things are actually the basis for food sovereignty. And when we are able to share that, that knowledge of, of how we are building back, um, you know, that opportunity when visitors come and we engage in cultural tourism, um, you know, we're using the background and we've already strengthened our communities in, in health. And so that, that food sovereignty is just really important 
in terms of tribal sovereignty and being prepared to take advantage of opportunities that that come through that. So um, go ahead, Elwood. I think I'm just going to lift my finger if you can see me each time. So uh, very happy to be here and able to share in this little bit of time with all of you. Uh, some of the work that we've been doing over the many years and some of the things that we found to be most important. And this slide basically shows you that in the middle, in the center of the circle, of course, are the community assets. And what we mean by those are, you know, the people, our elders, our youth, you know, any infrastructure, land, anything that we have uh, in our communities that are definite positives. And from that, in working with community food systems, you know, all of these areas around this um, circle became very evident and most important. So in trying to address any of the issues, we found that we ended up addressing many of them at the same time, more of a holistic approach for a community food system. So of course, you know, health and education and health and nutrition was most important for our community members in order for them time. in order for them to be able to you know move forward with whatever projects or whatever goals they had and in doing this we'll follow the circle around to the right uh, education and training became very important and we like to you know talk about anything that people learn as education versus so much training um, because education really is important and a basis of you know, moving forward with your projects in terms of networking and what you find out there that you can incorporate into your project. Most important for us was passing on the wisdom. We work a lot and worked a lot and continue to work a lot with our elders and the people in our communities that have been there a long time and are willing and happy to pass on the wisdom to those that want to learn those things. And of course, the next thing was a lot of outward outreach was done uh, with elders and youth and people low income, underserved, disabled, any of the people in our communities that were in need of a little bit of support and, and if you will, cheerleading. Um, onward, we went to business development and job creation. This is really important because um, in terms of job creation, you know, we found that working with families and within the community, there were lots of jobs that people were doing, lots of um, activities here in Taos that were considered as uh, you would, job, whether it was, you know, going for firewood, taking care of the elders, these are all um, opportunities for people in our community to establish themselves and move forward. Our food center, of course, um, moved from just the, um, creation of food and, and nutritious um, items for the community and community members onto value added products, which could be incorporated into other businesses and tourism and any um, commercial marketing that would be done. And there was no way for us to do anything in a food system without looking at you know, the environment and what's going on with our land and our water and, and how that is affecting and impacting our communities and working with your food system. A lot of policy and advocacy had to be addressed in order to make changes where necessary, advocate and educate those out there that have an impact on our communities. And then of course, marketing and distribution of any of the products that were created and any of the businesses that were developed. So next slide. So we'll, we'll just kind of go through these next slides of the uh, food center one by one and, and just briefly talk about it. So um, in developing a food center, we were able to get uh, six acres donated, raised two and a half million dollars and built a, a 25,000 square foot building, which was actually uh, two buildings in a in a circle, basically, and to utilize that land and water um, to also do gardens and um, 
the food center was 5,000 square foot commercial kitchen. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So that is our certified community, community kitchen, um, which had what we had was an incubator actually. So within that, people in the community who had already really expressed a strong interest in, in, in their food and in being able to market their food. So in order to do that, when we talk about how important infrastructure is in communities um, that are working on their food systems, in order to be able to create those small businesses, get that food out there and marketed, you know, you need to have that infrastructure. Um, next slide. We, we found that that worked really well for people in being able to develop those products and, and market them. At farmers markets, we were able, people were able to get their products in all the local stores. There were some regional markets and a couple of the businesses actually went um, national, which then provided more jobs, um, really helped those families out. But the reason that, one of the reasons that we thought that people were able to be successful was that they could do it at the time that worked for them. People have family responsibilities. Often they have responsibilities on the land. Um, those, as we discussed earlier with Dennis, those um, 40 hour a week jobs from eight to five don't really work many times, especially in some of our rural and isolated communities where we're so dependent upon each other for our daily lives. So by keeping that place open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, people were able to come in. We had a lot of women entrepreneurs and they had families, but they were able to work on the weekends or early in the morning or even at night and, and get their, their products prepared, packaged, um, stamped and you know out the door for whatever their purposes were. Next slide, please. We also following our community development um, philosophy thought it was you know also really important that people who were having um, health issues, particularly with diabetes, which is you know really. Um, unfortunately prevalent in most of our communities that we've worked with, it's an issue. So by bringing the elders in um, and letting them cook and look at those favorite dishes that they prepared and being able to bring in some of those indigenous foods and things that from the past they remembered eating and why and where they got them and gathered them and put those together, then they all had a, a lunch at the end of that time. And it was something that was um, very enjoyable. And we really miss um, being able to do that. <coughs> and we found that that's something that's also very common in the really 10 uh, native communities that we worked with during Woksape. Next slide. So, the food safety opportunity program that I had mentioned before that we were able to bring people from all over the, the country from numerous tribes to uh, take those classes were a week long. They were taught a, a lot by the regulators who agreed to come in and do the food safety things that people needed in order to be able to, to get those products out. And that varies a lot from state to state, but um, <clears throat> that, that really helped also not only, you know, looking at, at the food safety stuff, but it also really encouraged people um, to be proud of their foods and what they were and how they had always been prepared and eaten and just changed slightly in order to be on the market. Next slide. As we, we moved along with our 
with our food center and our community food program, we heard from um, our, particularly the Pueblos who were raising bison and some of the local ranchers, that it was just impossible for them um, these days to be able to market. They were really being squeezed out by uh, kind of industrial agriculture. Um, so we were able to get the second mobile livestock unit USDA approved in the country. And we were able to harvest bison in the field for the six Pueblos uh, that were, were raising buffalo at that time. And then for those who wish to, um, to get it um, marketable, but most of the tribes, of course, you know, distributed that within their own communities. Um, and that was uh, something that, that kind of was the end of that circle of, of food and, and the animals that we, we enjoy. Next slide. <clears throat> So also in our food center, you know, it was really important to pay attention to and focus on the traditional foods of the peoples of this area. And in doing so, we had, you know, of course, this is uh, Chef uh, Loretta Odin here, uh, demonstrations and, you know, cooking um, opportunities for, for people to connect with their traditional foods. Next slide. So basically just serving community, uh, churches, funerals, weddings and stuff, we're able to come in and, and work in the food center as well. Another reason that infrastructure is really great, um, you know, at, at that same time, as we mentioned with the, the Oxfam opportunity and, and people coming together and seeing each other at conferences all over the place, there was a lot of talk about a need for a national organization. Um, that would bring us together and to make a statement really uh, about Native American food and indigenous food ways. So we were able to facilitate and Excellent. found the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. And these are pictures of just some of the, the founders and people who came together um, in Taos to uh, write uh, indigenous food sovereignty resolution, which was passed around and uh, several tribes signed, which led us to um, NASA being formed thanks to a small grant from First Nations. Um, the international Indigenous Corn Conference was one of the features that we have talked about a lot um, in terms of cultural and indigenous tourism and bringing people um, to our communities and really sharing with them and recognizing those trade routes that went from all, all over this continent. You know, we, we now firmly know and, and can share that, that that was a feature and that it still is and that that's another opportunity for us with international visitors um, who have been really interested when communities are ready to come and visit and share in that culture. Excellent. Next slide. So we just wanted to thank, of course, Tribal Tech for this opportunity to make the presentation. And we're just going to briefly uh, go over a little bit of what we've uh, learned over so many years. We started when we were one year old, uh, so because we're still young. Um, and we're just gonna speak a little bit, next slide, please. We're gonna speak a little bit about our background and, and how we ended up with this being a focus. Both Patty and I and many others, you know, we started our work with uh, social justice work and it incorporated all different elements, whether it was housing, education, social services, youth, community development, all of these issues within our community, you know, were very important. And so in our work with um, 
all the way from the Boston Indian Center to Denver Indian Center to, you know, Taos and places in between, you know, the work of that we focused on had to do with social justice. And we also found that a lot of these projects are a direct response to a crisis in the community. And in this case, over these two years, the crisis has been in all of our communities and it was really COVID related. It had to do with a pandemic and which uh, affected people in terms of that whole community food and community se security and being able to be with each other. Next slide. These are just a few pictures of um, some of the slide. people um, that were at, at NAFSA and, and meetings in, you know, we just wanted to share that the whole that the whole nation and country is working on these issues all the way to T turtle island slow food association which became official slow food turtle slow food island um association is part of the international slow food and people felt that it was really important to carve out a seat at the table for indigenous foods and food knowledge. Um, much of slow food um, that had been discussed just sort of lumped us in um, as the United States of America. But, you know, people really felt that, that it needed to be um, an association to slow food that, that really, um, focused on getting that indigenous food knowledge out. Next slide, please. And these are just pictures of activities around Slow Food Turtle Island. Next slide. So now we want to talk about our current work with Woksape in the, what, 10 minutes we have? Right? <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have a lot of time left, but we still wanted to you know, all of the work that we had covered before, you know, for this two year project with Woksape, um, which is a state nonprofit and of course is sponsored by the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, NAFSA, in our partnership with the Office of Indian Ed of, of uh, Economic Development. Um, we found that there was a lot of technical assistance needs that were driven by the fellows that were chosen. And there were 10 initially um, chosen for this for this project in uh, cultural tourism. And as we explained with uh, the arrival of COVID and the pandemic, you know, we had to pivot and do some interesting, um, I guess, uh, activities for all of our fellows that had some particular needs within the food sovereignty and the ability to move forward with any kind of cultural tourism. So over the time, we've had over a dozen uh, speakers from dis distinguished presenters in Indian country, all the way from uh, the restaurant in um, Denver to you know people who are involved with uh, native, agriculture. native agriculture. So we're just going to go through a little bit with some of the um, some of the fellows projects that were funded through this this uh, grant. And, and I, I would like to say COVID really had a huge impact and all of the fellows that we worked with within their communities, their biggest priority was making sure that people had food and medicine. And they were just amazing in, in what they did. This program is in Fort Belknap in the Lodgepole Hayes area. Um, this fellow organized a food contest to be submitted on Facebook. And it brought a lot of youth into those discussions about food and food sovereignty and, and what you could do. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, also in Fort Belknap, Hannah Has Eagle um, is just amazing. I don't know how many pounds of food they have their community garden, they have an orchard, uh, they have a little store, which is also amazing called Red Paint Creek Store, which also has a, a community kitchen. 
And as we move through this, most people either have and are looking for that piece of the infrastructure that we're talking about where people can come together that is a community kitchen that's that's equipped enough so that people can you know really utilize it and do those value added things and get everything ready for farmers market next slide <laughs> so on on standing rock with their community development corporation um, they took on that job of food distribution. And you can see from this slide the, um, the amazing variety of, of ways that, that they worked with that. You know, bringing that food together, getting things from the food bank, bringing in what they had, um, and then doing it curbside and doing it walk up and doing it at the fairgrounds and whatever it took to make sure you know, that people did have that food as COVID was so devastating. Everyone lost people in their families and the strength that, that they brought back just to handle that crisis was so amazing. Next slide, please. Um, this is Sitting Bull College, um, which is, a uh, a cultural tourism program at Sitting Bull College with Jennifer Martell. But during this time, you know, when there really weren't visitors, um, they began to work on absolutely bringing back their, their medicines, packaging them and getting them out. So this is a kit that was given to particularly elders, but to people within those families who were currently dealing with COVID. Next slide, please. And these, this is just a, a picture of some of the things that they brought together. But, you know, we've also been discussing with everybody that all those things that, you know, they did, um, these things are possible um, value-added products that, you know, you can share and they can provide that economic development by selling them. Many of the the tribal communities that we were working with had um, have national parks and forests and you know those kind of things right around them. So as people come to visit when when tourism really returns, not only can they experience and see those things, but they should be able to buy them in in shops. So. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Fast Blackfeet um, in, in the Blackfeet tribe was um, so innovative in the things that they did because they were really a tribal health program and, you know, got, uh, was, were a center for um, distributing commodities. But what they were able to do also was to get uh, vouchers and things for the grocery stores. And they put together these local local produce boxes, um, you know, kind of replacing some of that uh, commodity stuff that was coming in and, and really looked at, you know, what, what their food was and what it could be again. Um, so, one of the things that they did that I thought was really amazing was really um, working with the, the Buffalo tribal program and the ranchers surrounding them and getting that meat in. And at one point they were actually able to pay hunters to also get that meat in the, in the food and the boxes that they were providing. Next slide. Also at Fast Blackfeet, there's a, young woman who just took over as their director, her name is Danielle Antelope. And she was totally raised and taught by grandmothers and aunties so that she actually uh, was very familiar with their indigenous medicines. And she organized what is becoming a cooperative of young women who are growing, foraging, um, 
those traditional medicines that are used in teas. And this is now a business because they come together, uh, they grow, they take the seeds, they grow it at home, they bring it in to the center. And they're also looking for funding and support for a commercial kitchen um, so that they can do even more than this tea. But that tea is already being sold in the community um, to their community store and, and a part of the food pantry as well. Next slide. Um, we finally, in two years, although travel had been a part of our initial proposal, it was, it was really impossible. It couldn't be done during COVID, during that whole two years. So we were finally ever able to bring everyone together and they actually prevented, presented at the Southwest Native Foods Conference uh, on Tohono Autumn and were able to participate in uh, harvesting of the saguaro cactus, which was really amazing. Uh, next slide. So we were asked to talk about our best practices and go ahead, Terry. So what we've learned over not just these two years, but the many years we've been working together is that all of the work in order to be successful really has to be community driven. It really needs to come from the ground up. Um, and in that way, you know, people really stick together and make things move forward. Uh, Patty and I have found that shared leadership in this whole, um, I, I guess, arena of community and economic development um, has really helped us to avoid burnout because it's very um, intensive. There's a lot of uh, happy times and there's a lot of sad times, as you could tell. Um, so to have that support of each other or whoever you're working with really um, was the best practice that you know we've seen duplicated in other projects elsewhere. Um, and then we found also that it was important to develop or at least to have a focus or infrastructure in place so that you, all programs and things have a place to um, convene and to plan and to carry on and to cry and to be happy. And to and, work. And, and, and to money. work. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was important, which is why we did not only the Denver Indian Center up in Denver, but also the uh, food center here in Taos. Um, it's just important to have that focus and you can change uh, what's happening there according to what your community is driving you to do, but you have a place all the time. And then what else we found was not just to have infrastructure and buildings and all those kinds of things, but there have to be solid programs, you know, to support the people, whether it's from, you know, government uh, funding or from people themselves, but there needs to be education and a lot of support to move forward. And then uh, the resilience, you know, we found that um, responding to the crisis, and in this case, you know, was COVID, um, you had to, you know, really pull together your resources and those assets that we talked about at the beginning, which were the elders and the people and all the strength within your community. And that's how, you know, we responded to crisis crises and also to be able to pivot and, and to address the most significant problem. As you plan for the future, you really have to take care of the present. So that's, he's, and then now we're at outcomes. So, you know, we, we do look at, again, what infrastructure is in place and if not, how are you going to get it? Um, but most places have some, uh, tribal buildings, some community centers, a, a place to begin. Um, what awareness has been identified and expanded? And I think you will see that um, in what the comments were from our fellows, which is how we'll, um, how we'll end this program, hopefully in a timely enough man manner. Okay, next slide. So these are the things that um, some of the fellows had to say. Um, gained a sense of not being alone, sense of ownership, 
celebrating challenges, the value of relationships and establishing them with those who have a community heart. Uh, Noni hopes that future fellows will be willing to learn the value of sharing traditions. Uh, Danielle thought because she was hired mid project and came, came on uh, that she was told she should join this group. And when she came on her first call, everybody was laughing and just chilling and doing a check-in. And she, she wondered what, what was going on. I've never been on a Zoom like this before. Um, she said, what did I get from Woksape? So much laughter on every meeting. Uh, it was like a relief because everybody works hard all the time, especially during this crisis. So coming together, um, she says she looked forward to the calls and being with the group. Um, next slide. And in Fort Belknap and Hayes, um, one of the comments that, you know, I thought she said it means the world to be part of the fellowship. And I agreed with that. It, it means a lot to me. And I've really thought a lot about what she said about gaining a foundation, building a healthy web to catch dreams, to be bonded together and know that we're not alone and be reminded of all the hard work across the reservations and tribal communities. And Jennifer from Sitting Bull College Visitor Center, um, you know, as you saw with what she pulled together, um, getting people out there to, to harvest and forage these things that she put in her in her kits, uh, survive through our own traditional ways of life, um, strengthen North Dakota. Stacy LeConte was a partner of ours and she, she mentioned how much she enjoyed the TA sessions and was able to share the, the information and Ray Moore um, from Standing Rock, building and strengthening partnerships with the team of Woksape. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Next slide, that's our contact information. We'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Patty and Terry. This is Malkana. It looks like there are not yet any questions in the chat. Um, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, thank and thank you everyone for sharing your email addresses in the chat. You can kind of keep them coming in. Uh, Dennis. Thank you, Makana. Appreciate it. And thank you, ladies. I um, appreciate that. I've seen a lot of folks I've known in some of those pictures. So that was, that was nice. Um, <laughs> Recognize people. Oh, yeah. Somebody's asked if we'll do more fellowships. Uh, I can only say we hope so. <laughs> our our uh, current funding, of course, is um, ending in September. But mm. I know we'll keep relationships. Okay. Well, thank you, Tal. Appreciate it. So we're almost right on schedule. So up next, we're going to be having Clara Pratt, uh, she's Navajo Nations with Strongbow Strategies. Uh, she's gonna be talking about utilizing cultural knowledge for ecotourism. Um, I won't get much into her bio. I know we have that link in the, um, that's provided. So I'll let her dig into that if she, if she feels it's appropriate. Uh, so Clara, are you ready to roll? Hopefully we're not on mute and you're rolling with it. Hi, Dennis, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello, mm -hmm. good, good. Oh, am I, is my camera not on? It is not on either, hold on one second. There we go, now mm -hmm. I can. Now we oh, can see. I'm not this pale as the light is really. <laughs> I did get some sunshine on. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> All right. So you want me just to go right into it? Yes. 
All right, great. Well, thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, it's an honor to spend this time with you. I'm uh, dialing in today from Flagstaff, Arizona, right at the base of the Coal Slid, one of our uh, sacred mountains here on the Navajo Nation. Um, and today I wanted to talk a little bit about the project that we undertook under the, uh, with, the with the support of the Office of Indian Energy Economic Development. Um, the uh, the wool mill project. So it's kind of broader than a wool mill, as we'll see going through it. What started out as a simple, we want to create a wool mill, and how that came about, um, really expanded into a broader scope. Uh, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about that. So today my presentation is cultural knowledge and ecotourism, and really about creating sustainable and a culturally appropriate visitor experiences. So um, with that, we can go right in. So today I'm going to go cover a few, a few items. This is just the outline here. I wanted to provide a background of ecotourism as an industry, uh, go over the historical perspective of tourism in Indigenous communities overall, uh, and then how do we reinvest and redefine uh, these experiences to meet the needs of Indigenous communities. Uh, and then from there, I'll transfer into the wool mill concept, how that came about and, and why we thought this might be a good idea. Uh, looking at this concept of agribusiness, specifically wool industry worldwide, talking a little bit about our timelines and what we see on the horizon. Next slide, please. So first of all, ecotourism is defined pretty broadly. It's responsible tourism to natural areas aimed at sustainability, conservation, and investment in local people. It's a double-edged sword because while many people in the world recognize the need for responsible ecotourism, there also isn't a watchdog per se. There isn't a way to hold entities accountable. So almost anybody can say we're ecotourists or we're being an ecotourism minded company, but it really is dependent on how those are, are run, right? So there's no good housekeeping seal of approval that says, oh, that's ecotourism or that's real ecotourism. So it can be a little bit of a catch-all phrase, almost like the term organic before there was actual um, meat to determine what organic really meant. Uh, it can be a little bit of that. So it's really important that when you see the phrase ecotourism, um, that it is really truly being sustainable and in consideration with the local community impacted by that ecotourism. Um, however, it is a growth industry. You'll see from 2019, um, you know, projected into 2027, it is uh, almost a double growth rate for ecotourism as an industry. Um, and the source of this is uh, the worldwide uh, tourism industry uh, metrics. They're talking about ways for tour, tour operators to increase their profit margins is to add more ecotourism types of uh, visits on their offerings because that's what the consumer wants. All right, the consumer today is more um, community minded, more uh, trying to do things in a more culturally appropriate way, even though they don't know what that means, they want to be sensitive to that. So what, what this graph tells us is that this is going to be a booming industry. Um, and if tribal uh, operators, um, uh, entities want to benefit from this, then we really have to get in front of it and define what that means, lest you know, we get taken advantage of on the back end. Next slide. So historic tourism in indigenous communities, uh, this photograph here is from the natural, National Archives and it's of the Grand Canyon. It's from 1903. Um, tourism historically has been very exploitive. I mean, think of the safari, you know, the, the British uh, colonial idea of going out and conquering and looking at these wild places. And unfortunately, the indigenous people that inhabited these places uh, were often collateral damage in that process. Um, they were uh, not defining the terms of tourism, not benefiting predominantly from the tourism activities on the, on the, plus, on the, on the best case scenario, and on the worst case scenario being forcibly um, 
dislocated from these activities. Uh, the Grand Canyon is a really good example of that. You have the Hualapai and Supai people uh, that are indigenous. Those are the indigenous homelands. And with the influx of tourism, you really saw a displacement of, of those folks impact on land, lifeways, and culture. Um, and it was not historically acknowledged by the historic tourism industries. So ecotourism and in indigenous territory territories should really facilitate the involvement and experiences of, of indigenous people. And I would say a step further than that, not just facilitate, involve, and the experience, it should really be driven by indigenous people. So, you know, um, indigenously owned tourism companies, indigenously defined tourism experiences, indigenously defined areas. Uh, there will be there will be tribal areas that we ne don't necessarily want people to visit, even if they are beautiful. Um, we don't want people to be there for a variety of reasons. It might be a sacred site. It might be um, a gathering site for uh, specific plants, etc. Next slide. So reinvesting and redefining um, ensures that Indigenous people are not just consulted, but are in the lead of ecotourism plans. Um, you see a lot of tribal governments creating tourism departments or regulations around tourism, uh, creating plans within economic development hubs. And those can be groups that are led by nonprofits, for-profits, educational government, tribal government, or even cross-cutting collaborations. Uh, there is a group out here on the Navajo Nation that's led by um, Diné College that it seeks to do just that. And there is a tourism department at the Navajo Nation as well. So, you know, understanding the ways to really flex those regulatory and defining muscles uh, to help shape um, a, a, a good tourism um, economy, um, one that is open to tourism and one that uh, provides a good experience for visitors and guests while respecting the local community heritage and people. Um, one of the things that we looked at and how we got involved specifically in agriculture as a driver for tourism is understanding the community values, interests, and location quotient. So, you know, the idea of, of wool on the Navajo Nation, um, pottery in the Pueblos, um, different types of arts in various communities, fisheries in the Pacific Northwest. So location quotient is a way of looking at industries and occupations that are really unique to a specific economy. So uh, taking to account of uh, the Pacific Northwest, if fishery jobs on tribal lands accounts for 12 and a half percent of jobs, but only 1% of jobs nationally, then the city or communities, um, uh, says bakeries, but that should be fisheries, has a location quotient of 12 and a half, which means the industry is 12 and a half times more concentrated in the region, in that tribal region, than in the typical region. So understanding things where, where people are creating jobs, where people are you know, already doing work in certain defined industries that might be of interest to visitors and guests. Next slide. So the wool mill concept. Again, sheep culture is synonymous with Navajo culture. I grew up in a sheep rearing uh, family. We had, I think at our largest, about 100, 140 head of sheep and I don't know how many goats. Um, and it was a real lifestyle and um, economic driver for our family. My grandfather, that was his job, is he was a sheep herder and he herded sheep every single day. Um, and, uh, you know, going back to school, I can remember we would sell sheep to you know, go ahead and go back to school and get our school clothes and our pencils and pens and all that stuff. So it was a way, it was an investment tool as well. It was a way for families to invest, to have uh, an asset that you know, grew with time. Um, and it was a, a true lifestyle. I mean, we, we, we ate the sheep, we sold the wool. I personally never processed the wool, but I've learned a lot about it in the, in the last few years for sure. So Navajo weavers, wool, and um, artisans are regarded throughout the world. Um, there are many places in the world that are like this that we'll get to. Uh, uh, wool, rugs, and natural dyes. And despite this really strong sheep culture, what we discovered is that the Navajo Nation does not have any wool processing on the nation. Um, and when I say wool processing, I mean a, a bigger wool processing facility. Uh, most wool processing uh, that local artisans or grassroots community members do is by hand. Uh, so they will cart it, you know, locally, dye it locally with uh, 
plant-based vegetable dyes, et cetera. But in terms of a large, almost co-op model of wool where somebody as an outsider can come in and say, I've heard good things about Navajo wool. I want to buy a bunch of it. There's, there's nothing of that nature. It's not been trademarked. It's not been anything, despite having a very high location uh, quotient in the agricultural community and being well known throughout the world. So agriculture appeals to our people uh, and to many people for economic and cultural reasons that I've explained. Uh, currently, we have uh, a few more female farmers than male farmers, actually. So about 12,000 male farmers, almost 14,000 female farmers that operate working functional family farms on the Navajo Nation. Um, and 21,000 of those actually live on the farm that they operate. 21,000 of those have been working on the same farm for 10 years or more. So these are long-standing family farms, such as um, our family that had sheep and goats, um, which unfortunately now we have maybe about eight. So going from 140 to eight is quite drastic. Um, and part of that is just the economy. Uh, it's not economically viable to choose that as a life way anymore because we have car payments and truck payments and all of these other things that uh, it's not sustainable and there's not enough demand or at least in our mind not enough demand for the product that we're creating. Uh, we have about almost 5,000 beef cattle farms uh, with a little over 40,000 head of cow cattle and about 10,000 sheep farms with 193,000 sheep. So really on Navajo, when you think about it, the latest census, almost 400,000 people, half of those 200,000 or so live off the nation. So head per head, person to sheep, we're about the same, almost 200,000 sheep and about 200,000 people on the Navajo nation. Next slide. This is kind of small, sorry. I tried to put a lot of information in here. So the wool mill concept actually started um, it predates my involvement, just this idea of a wool mill, uh, because the nation has been looking into this for quite some time. My interest in it came um, in my travels when, because I'm a knitter, personally, I like to knit, although I'm a little bit out of practice. Uh, but I, I, you know, I previously used to love to knit. And uh, I started visiting places in the world um, that had knitting yarn just out of interest. And I was going to these places and, you know, spending a lot of money for a tiny little skein of yarn, like $20, $30, $50, $100 sometimes for a skein of yarn. And uh, just thinking about if I'm crazy enough as a tourist to do this in other places, why aren't we capitalizing this on our own homelands for people like me that want specialized yarn? Uh, back in 2012, the Navajo Nation wool buy program began. So wool buyers from mid-state wool growers, Peace Fleece Wool, Teddy's Mohair, they would spend a week um, picking up wool across the Navajo Nation. And from 2012 to 2016, uh, we increased from 75 to 458 individuals that were selling wool to these wool buy programs. And the revenues returned to the producers from 8,000 to 73,000. And that's for unprocessed wool. The majority of the value add comes after processing. So in 2018, um, me and my company began studying the economic viability of the wool industry. And we looked at different models across the world and we collected data and we determined um, having an established wool mill would not only be profitable, but also it had the added benefit of traditional knowledge keeping and job creation and providing a sustainable life path for those that wanted to go into the agricultural business. But for whatever reason, like me and my family had started to go away from that for, for economic reasons. Um, after lots and lots of discussions and study, we officially partnered with our tribal college, Diné College, to house the wool mill at the college in coordination with their land grant office. Um, to date, we've held several wool grading classes. So um, wool grading is one of those uh, occupations that cannot be done by machine. It has to be done by hand and it has to be done by trained hand. Um, and you take a uh, sheared wool that's right off of the sheep and it's touching, feeling, pulling so that you can get a good idea of what grade of wool that might be. And depending on that grade, it goes to what the usage would be. So if it's extra fine, fine, medium, coarse, et cetera, extra coarse, then that is going to determine the usage of what that wool will be. The reason why we partnered with Diné College on this is not only were they well aware of the wool by program and coordinating on 
that side. Um, but they are also working with the local producers to improve the sheep flock itself. So they have a ram, uh, a ram library, I guess you'd say. So you don't want to have your same ram studying the same ewes year in, year out. So Dene College has rams that you can swap in and out season, you know, depending on the year, so that you're improving the quality of the wool, um, working with producers to improve the quality of what will ultimately be eaten as sheep meat um, and going from there. So it's a really, a really good partnership with the land grant office. Uh, we've developed an online presence for educational content. We've also put in there that hasn't been activated, but it's there waiting in the ring, wings as an online sales portal for the finished product. Because again, the raw wool will net a grower a decent amount, but the value add comes from the processing. So if we provide a space where we can process that wool, we can then sell it for a higher amount um, to off takers. And that those funds, that, that greater delta will come back to the folks that it should come back to, the people that have been caring for those animals and putting their heart and soul into making sure those animals um, are taken care of and producing amazing wool. So right now, as we speak, we have a baler um, coming in from overseas. It's been a strange year for wool. I'll get into that. And by the end of this presentation, you'll know more about wool than you might ever wanted to know. Uh, but we're in, the processing of we're in the process of delivering and setting up a wool baler. It's on its way from overseas. Uh, it should be arriving at the Los Angeles Harbor at any point in time, at which point we have a truck picking it up and taking it to Saley at Danette College. And the wool baler is, is a important tool to have because that's what we utilize to put it into bales and bales um, is the product unit that is purchased uh, at auction for procurement um, that this will return a greater revenue share to producers and keep processing profits on the nation next slide please Wool mills worldwide. So again, in my in my travels, I went to Scotland, Iceland, and uh, Ireland, and looked at wool producing um, industries there. In my previous in my previous life, when I was just traveling and enjoying and looking for good wool knitting, but I always kept this stuff in the back of my mind because I knew it would be useful one day. Um, so Icelandic wool is known for its waterproof properties, which is kind of interesting because it is an island. It's very durable. And I did a tour there maybe 10 years ago and I visited like three wool mills. Um, spent a lot of money on wool. I probably still have some. And sheep outnumber people uh, by about 200,000 people on the island. So they have uh, as, about as many sheep as, uh, well, they have more sheep than we do on the nation for sure. Um, but they have a lot of sheep there and it's a specific kind of sheep. And sales of knitting yarn grew by 50% last year of all Icelandic wool. It was a, it, the year 2021 was a record year for Icelandic wool for revenue and profit. The reverse of that is the Scotland, the Scottish wool market has dropped significantly over the past year. They have a different type of wool. Their wool is not knitting wool. Um, their wool is shorter hair wool. They use it to make tartans that you see there in the lower left. On the lower right is Icelandic wool and it's used to make in the upper left those types of sweaters. Um, Scottish wool is used to make these tartan types of material, very fine, almost cashmere type of feeling. Uh, their, in, their industry dropped because um, fast fashion, what we know is fast fashion. Most of us get our clothing nowadays um, that where we get our clothing is really fast fashion. We might pick up a couple t-shirts at Old Navy, pair of pants from Walmart, you know, we're just kind of fast fashion and there are 72 seasons every single year. It's not just winter, spring, summer, and fall. There are, there's something new at the store every single week. And as a result, clothing becomes disposable. And as a result, we look for cheap, cheap price. So we'll spend $20, $40 on a pair of pants. But very few of us are going to spend $300, $400, $500 on a pair of everyday pants that are made out of wool. So market drivers are that knitting wool went up, fashion wool or, or short hair wool went down. However, this is changing. So even though this is the current state of affairs for wool, um, what we're seeing in the industry is that more people are turning away from fast fashion, realizing that it might not be the most sustainable way. Our landfills are filled with clothing. Um, you know, it used to be back in the day, you would buy a dress and you might have that dress for 20 years. Um, and people are kind of looking to that now of how can I get things that are made of quality 
that will last a very long time, that are seasonless and that are timeless. I think we'll always have trends, uh, but I think more people are thinking in this line now. So hopefully that will increase uh, wool um, desire to go up. Next slide. Okay. Oh, and interesting reason that knitting, apparently knitting uh, wool went up last during the pandemic is when more people were home. So more people were knitting and that caused Icelandic wool to just go through the, uh, go through the roof. So timelines and barriers on our wool project. Um, our initial goal was really lofty. We were just gonna, you know, we're gonna look at the viability of a wool mill. We were gonna meet with local sta stakeholders. We were gonna set up an LLC. We were gonna withdraw land and we were gonna have a brick and mortar wool mill with online sales by 2022. Great, sounded like a great idea. Well, we started to get, we got through the first two items there. Uh, and then the pandemic happened and everything just sort of went up in the air. We were not sure what our new plan was going to be. Operating a brick and mortar um, wool mill seemed kind of, or a store in any case, seemed very out of the, uh, out of reach. So we waited and we thought about what we we're going to do with our revised goal. So our revised goal is we wanted to find some entity that already had land withdrawn, a land holder, in this case, Danette College. And we shifted from a brick and mortar to online sales, auctions, and then have this education model online so that we could educate people about the wool process, Navajo wool specifically, and its ties to traditional knowledge keeping, um, and supporting Danette College in the establishment and the ownership. So we're on our way there. Right when we were ready to file our documentation, um, it was very clear that the college lacked the authority to own a for-profit entity. It was not in its charter. So we had to go back to the drawing board and something that we didn't plan for is we needed to pass legislation with the Navajo Nation Council to allow the Diné College Charter to be amended so that they could own a for-profit entity. So we sought legislation, um, success. It passed the council in 2021. And then it was vetoed by the president in the same week. So it went back to the drawing board. And there were other things in that bill, which were the reason, the driver for the veto. Uh, but nevertheless, since our provision was in there, we were stuck alongside that ride. So we had to go back to the drawing board, recrafting, reworking, making sure that they got that legislation through. And then it was finally passed and signed by the president of the Navajo Nation this year. Um, and now we are in the transfer of ownership process for the assets, like the baler that's going to be coming. Um, we want to make sure we get that out of Strongbow's inventory and into the college's inventory, into the LLC that we've established for them. So that's transferring over. And now we're updating the online presence with educational content. We have videographers and photographers uh, filming and taking pictures and doing things now for the project so that we can load those on the, on the online uh, portal. And we're expected to have that go live, hopefully before the end of 2022. So that's where we're at. So lots of things that we did not anticipate. Um, next slide. So our next steps really to continue to build capacity at the college. So we've established the business, we've done the business plan, we've done the modeling, we know how to make it successful. Now, as we turn over the keys to the kingdom, it's really important that we continue to provide that technical assistance to the college so that this is a success and so that they can continue to grow this and make it a profitable entity to bring in revenues, not only for the sheep producers, but as a revenue source for the college as well, as well as a learning module for the college's business uh, students and the agricultural students. Um, we're going to be setting up that wool ba baler that's arriving, uh, hopefully by the end of September. We're going to have to do training on the baler and ensure the baler, make sure, you know, it's safely operated. Uh, the wool buys from individuals are ongoing, so we are accepting wool at the college from local producers um, now through the end of the year, and then we will bail them up and pay those producers on a pound basis, per pound basis, um, and then we will sell that at auction, and there's a, multiple auctions that are going on all over uh, the southwest. Um, our goal is to also to uh, register a trademark um, for intellectual property, the, the Navajo wool specifically, so that if you're in a store and you see something marked Navajo wool, that you will know and have confidence that it is indeed 
Navajo uh, produced wool. Um, Diné College has done something similar in the past, and there are other entities that have done something similar in the past. Uh, the Navajo Beef Program is a really well-known program. I think they just changed it to Native American beef, though, because uh, they they now have uh, beef producers from Apache, from our, our our neighbors to the south. So Native American beef. If you go to a restaurant, like to any of the facilities here, that say Native American beef, it's beef that has been uh, grown and produced um, both on Navajo as well as Apache nations. We'd like to build up our online sales, also utilizing that trademark of Navajo wool. Um, and then we want to integrate it into a concept known as the Heritage Loop Trail. And this is where the ecotourism piece comes into place. So when we invite visitors onto the nation, they're coming for a variety of reasons. They might be coming to look at the landscape, they might be coming for a specific event or to buy arts and crafts. Um, we're really good at keeping them going back into the border communities. We're not so great at keeping them on the nation for a period of time and keeping those dollars there on the nation for a period of time. So our concept here is to create a heritage loop concept um, that a, a visitor can easily come on to a tribal nation, in this case, Navajo Nation, and say, oh, if I'm gonna take this, there's a map here, there's a heritage loop. The, this will be pre-vetted with local communities so that we're not um, going into areas where people don't want people on well-traveled pathways. And then you can help set up artisans along that way. Um, they can also visit the wool mill. They can visit other things that are open for public visitation um, that have support, local community support. And then lastly, but not um, least, is buying more equipment. So uh, getting carters, spinners, washers, wool production and wool cleaning is a very labor intensive and resource intensive, water intensive, and can be chemically intensive um, process. So working at ensuring that we're decreasing our usage of resources and our reliance on any sort of chemical for processing, uh, that would be our next step there. Uh, next slide. So the takeaway here that I had on this project, and I thought it would be easy. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, this is a great idea. We're just going to do this, and I'll have this great idea, and I'll put it on paper, and we'll execute it, and it'll happen. Um, the initial concept may change greatly was my takeaway. Uh, my main goal was supporting local wool producers. And as long as I kept that main goal in mind, um, along with cultural retention and making a fair price market, as long as I kept those goals in mind, it was... It, it, you know, keeping my eye on the prize, make being flexible with the other things that was super helpful. I thought we would end up owning and operating a wool mill. Um, and this turned into a college owned project because that's the best interest and the best success. So just being super flexible, um, but keeping that overall goal in mind was really important. But it's been really, really fun. And I see the nexus across tribal communities, specifically for the agricultural portion of tourism and how do we integrate those traditional um, knowledge keeping pieces and really start to drive ecotourism from our own point of view um, for our own benefit as tribal people. And with that, I will turn it back over and open it up to questions in the group. Thank you, Clara. This is Makana. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet. Um, we are coming up on our break. And so I'm thinking that if any questions come up during the break, that maybe you can just check the chat uh, and respond as we continue to move on. Uh, let's all, uh, we're, we're running a little early. Uh, so we're about five minutes early. And so let's plan to be back at 15 minutes past the hour, uh, which is in six minutes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're about 15 past the hour, so we will go ahead and keep on with the program. Um, up next, this has got to be one of my favorite. I um, just wish I could be in all places at once. We're going to have a choose your adventure. Um, scenario. You're free to pick whichever. We have four distinct tourism projects that are going to highlight and give presentations on their projects and their approaches. Um, you're free to jump between rooms, get a taste of all. We have the La Pasta Band of Mission Indians, we have the Sunny Inez Band of Chumash Indians, 
Blue Lake Rancheria, and then the Mesa Grande Business Development Core. So you should be able to choose here very shortly. And again, you're free to jump around and this will go until about 45 minutes. So uh, we'll reconvene back as a group around that time uh, for a networking, another networking breakup session. So uh, let's get going. We have all the names entered. So if you all are ready, here we go. Teresa Taylor, please stay on so that we can follow up and get some information on how to send your rides. Dennis, back to you. Uh -huh. That was pretty neat. Thanks. <laughs> and congratulations. And so I would like now since we're getting close to the end here to personally thank everybody this was a huge endeavor thank everybody from tribal tech to our team to the grantees that that um, provided content and presentations and just being here uh I, I, this was impactful for myself so uh, i would like to turn this over to our chief denise for closing thank you so much um Dennis, I wanted to um, thank you from the bottom of my heart for everyone who's joined. This is our first virtual grantee um, meeting that we're convening. And, um, you know, we're thrilled that everyone took the time to be with us, um, to engage in opportunities, to share about your project, to also be the recipients of um, hopefully helpful information that can move your projects forward. And we hope that you have experienced a sense of collaboration um, as a result of convening with us. Tall Moanina, appreciate everybody being here. Uh, we'll stay on for a little bit. If you have any questions, concerns, you're free to reach out to us by email. I'll be following up independently on some items that um, come to my attention. And we really thank you all. Appreciate your time. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, and Thank you. have a great rest of the uh, day and evening, and stay in touch. We look forward to hearing more about your projects. Mm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. <laughs>